Um, thank you, Tom. It's nice to have you describe what I'm going to be talking about today, so I'll rearrange my notes accordingly. <laughs> um, and also, um, I, I want you to know how surprised I am to see so many people here. It's, it's nice that Dutch uh, pulled me out of obscurity to uh, uh, be able to face such a nice group. I'm sorry I'm wearing a, um, probably one of only two people in the entire room wearing a suit. Um, I didn't go to church either, but... Uh, um, I'm wearing a tie. Okay, we have a bow tie. <laughs> I wanted to say, too, that uh, two dear friends, uh, uh, Gene and Gordon Duffy, are here, who I served in the legislature with from... I was there from uh, 1978 to 1982. And uh, they're both Republicans, and I a Democrat, but, you know, those were... That was a period of time where we got along very well, and the state uh, was was in the black, and schools were operating, and uh, I wish we could go back to that period. Uh, my dear, dear friend, Erla Snow, uh, just asked if um, the reason I'm here giving a speech is that I'm running for something again, <laughs> and I assure you that is not the case. Um, I'll tell you a little story. Um, in the election of 1990, I had been in the Congress for eight years, and I'd never been a darling of the most liberal part of the Democratic Party. Um, that's because from time to time I would vote for a defense appropriations bill. I had the notion our country did need some sort of a military, and every so often I would um, vote to allow at least some of the loggers up north to keep working. Well, um, this. Uh, stuck in the craw of a large group of Democrats. And so in the election of 1990, uh, they formed the Peace and Freedom Party. And uh, when, uh, I didn't pay much attention to it, but when election day came, uh, the Republican got about the same number of votes that they always do in the district. But the Peace and Freedom got 15%. And so I lost by a very, very small margin. And it was quite a, a surprise, certainly to me. But I determined that because of this kind of fluke that I would uh, try to get my seat back again in two years. And so um, I, I practiced law for about a year, and then when it came time to start campaigning, I hired a pollster to take a poll to see, you know, what the lay of the land was. And um, it cost me $20,000 out of my own money because, you know, when you lose, you don't have a campaign account. And um, uh, eventually the poster called and said he had taken the poll and was going to report to me on it. I said, well, was it good news or bad news? And he said, well, it was good news and bad news. So I said, well, let's start with the good news. He said, well, the good news is that it appears that a, a, a large section of the electorate is willing to throw out the incumbent. And I said, well, gee, that's great news. You know, what more could I ask for? Um, what's the bad news? He said, well, a lot of them think you still are the incumbent. <laughs> so, under that theory, Erla, I'm not running for anything. <laughs> As most of you probably know, about 13% of the American people like the U.S. Congress. That's the lowest it's ever been. Um, remember, it used to be on the toothpaste um, containers. It might still be where they'd say, 87% of the dentists think you should brush your teeth every day. And I always wondered, who are the 13% of the dentists that don't think that? <laughs> well, apparently the same group uh, still likes the U.S. Congress. Um, Today I'm going to talk mostly about the House of Representatives uh, because I'm more familiar with it, obviously, from having served there. But I will say that the Senate and the House are two completely separate organizations. People don't realize that because they share space in the Capitol, uh, but they have their completely separate rules, uh, completely separate leadership, uh, they hire completely separate <coughs> staff, and uh, they're separate institutions. But a lot of what I'm going to say today, I think, applies to, to both the House and the Senate. Um, last week, I attended a candidate's night 
over um, in Santa Rosa because, as you probably know, there's a very hotly contested congressional race over there because Lynn Woolsey retired, the district changed because of reapportionment, and there's a hotly contested congressional race for an open seat, which doesn't happen too often. Um, and one of the candidates who's now in the legislature, a very bright young man, um, said that if he got elected to Congress, the first thing he was going to do is go over on the other side and shake hands with a Republican. <laughs> and this got uh, quite a nice applause because I think most people feel that um, Republicans and Democrats in the Congress don't like each other. You might think that from all the venom and vitriol that comes out of their mouths. Uh, but nothing could be further from the truth. They do like each other. On the average day, when the House goes into session at noon, and uh, a member will get up and make a point of order that a quorum isn't present, the Speaker will ring the bells, the bells ring all over the Capitol, out in the office buildings, the pagers, and the room will fill up with the most gregarious, affable, extroverted <laughs> group of people you've ever seen in your life. Um, the din is amazing. It's like a high school cafeteria on the House floor with the handshaking, backslapping, gossiping, joke telling. This group does like each other. They like each other personally. Uh, they just can't work together. Um, this is because of an odd characteristic that they have, and it isn't found in most groups. They're willing to do each other in at the drop of a hat. <laughs> and naturally, that does make it difficult to work together. <clears throat> this isn't due to personal animus, but it is due to the fact that they operate in an organization where the winner takes all. It's a sweepstakes world, where if your party wins the majority, you win all the power. And if your party lose, you lose it all. To the victor be, uh, belongs the spoils. And there are no scraps thrown to the other side. There's no shared power. And an individual member of the majority party has a good chance of accomplishing his or her goal in the Congress. But an individual member of the minority party has no chance at all. He or she is like a eunuch walking the halls, uh, greeting the school kids, uh, answering constituent mail. Uh, but when it comes down to power, the minority party and the individuals in it have none. Um, while the Congress operates in the greatest democracy ever <coughs> in the world, uh, the Congress is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy. And the power in it is funneled through a very few people. And those few will always be of the majority party. No exception. Now, what does this mean? Uh, let's say in November coming up, uh, when all the votes are counted across the country, 218 Democrats win election to the Congress and 217 Republicans win election difference of one person. What will happen in that case is Speaker Bonner will lose his job. Every Republican committee chair will lose their job. Every subcommittee chair will lose his or her job. The new Democratic Speaker will select and control the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee will propose new rules for the Congress. The rules will pass. The Rules Committee will decide what bills are scheduled to be heard in the House, how long the debate on each of those bills will last and how it will be divided, how, how, um, how many amendments, if any, can be offered to the bill, and what amendments may be offered. And so if you get the idea that this isn't exactly a democracy, um, you're right. And let's talk a little bit about the power of a committee chair. I told you that they would all change, every one of them, 18. 
Um, when I was first elected to the Congress, um, I had spent a lot of time in the legislature. A passion of mine is uh, restoring the rivers and streams and the fisheries. And that's become very popular, but back then it wasn't uh, a major cause. And I uh, was looking at the Klamath River. Uh, the Klamath River is very degraded, but it once produced about a third of all of the salmon and steelhead on the California coast and in, in the ocean. So I wanted to restore that river. I spent a lot of time developing a bill to do that. We got experts from everywhere, the different departments of government, the Cal University of California. I spent a lot of time writing the bill. And I got myself on the committee that uh, does that type of thing. It was called the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, and it had jurisdiction over all of the oceans in the, in the United States. Um, the chairman of that committee was a fellow from North Carolina, an elderly gentleman named Walter Jones. <clears throat> so I introduced um, my bill, and I waited for a month or so uh, for the hearing to be set, and as Gordon and Jean know, in the legislature where I have been, any bill that you introduce, you get a hearing on. Uh, you may not <coughs> win, but you at least, the committee at least hears your bill. Um, so, after about a month, I went to the chief staff person from the committee and I said, um, you know, when's my bill going to be heard by the committee? And he said, your bill? Um, said, oh yeah, HR such and such. And he said, well, um, Congressman, I hate to tell you this, but your bill is not a priority for Mr. Jones. Um, he has a lot of other stuff on his plate, and I'm sorry to say this, but your bill is not going to get a hearing in the committee. Well, of course, I was crestfallen because we put so much time into this bill. Well, about the same time, about a month later, Barbara Boxer introduced legislation that would have prohibited offshore oil drilling anywhere in the United States. And uh, that bill didn't have much of a chance of passing, but um, it was very popular, of course, on the north coast of California, which was my district. And um, I was thinking, of course, that I would support that measure. But all of a sudden, this fellow um, that was Mr. Jones's chief of staff came to my office and said, I'm, I'm bringing you a, a message from the chairman, Mr. Jones. Um, that he is very much in favor of offshore oil drilling. They have it on his coast in North Carolina. He knows all the players. And he would view it as sort of a slap in the face uh, if you were to support that bill and sign on as a co-author. And he'd like you to just um, tell Mr. Boxer that you're not going to be supporting it. The bill will come to his committee anyway where it will be killed in a second. Um, but he as a favor, he'd like you not to support that bill. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, here my committee chairman wants me to not support it. Barbara's over here and, you know, 90% of my constituents like that bill. But I thought, I'm going to be on that committee for a long time, so... I thought about it and called Barbara and said, Barbara, I'm not going to be able to support your bill. And I went to... Um, staff person and said, you can tell Mr. Jones that I won't be supporting the offshore oil ban. The next day, uh, this fellow comes to my office and says, Mr. Jones has taken a huge interest in your fisheries bill. <laughs> he thinks it's one of the best pieces of legislation to come before his committee um, this, this year. And uh, the hearing on it will be next week in his committee. Uh, well, within uh, a month, that bill passed out of Mr. Jones's committee. He brought it up on the House floor. It passed uh, almost unanimously, went on to the Senate where he helped me with it, signed into law by President Reagan. Um, so that probably gives you an idea of the kind of power that committee chairmen have in the House. And um, that power is used very discriminately in very much the manner that I just described from personal experience. When all those committee chairmanships change, uh, you can only imagine how the power shifts. And it shifts 
or that party that has control by a simple majority of the members that are elected. From 1931 to 1995, the Democrats controlled the House. That's about, except for two brief periods of time, that's about 60 years. And the Republicans had no expectation of ever being in the majority. And so they settled into kind of a polite working relationship with the Democrats. And the power structure with the parties existed, but it wasn't a dominant factor in how the House got its business done. From time to time, the Republicans and Democrats would square off. But it wasn't, uh, party politics wasn't the dominant factor of how the organization worked. And every year, about 14 or so appropriation bills were considered by the Congress. Uh, one for each Department of Government, the Department of Justice, Health and Human Services, Interior, Defense. Each one would have their own separate appropriation bill. And it was seen to it by the House leadership that the members had earmarks in each of those bills. Now earmarks have gotten a very, very bad reputation. Earmarks are where members of Congress stick their special projects into a bill, projects that will usually just help their district. Um, and earmarks had a very important role because they were sort of a power sharing because the Republicans had their earmarks and the Democrats had their earmarks. And every bill had its earmarks and every bill passed because when some member of Congress has a project that's important to them in the bill, they vote for the bill, right? And uh, if you're a Republican and have a project in there, you vote for the bill, even though it was authored by a Democrat. An example of this would be my predecessor, uh, Don Clawson, who represented um, the North Coast District for um, 20 years. And Don Clawson had an earmark uh, in one of those bills. Even though he was a Republican member of Congress under Democratic leadership, his earmark was the Warm Springs Dam and can, uh, hopefully with the rain it's spilling up, but can you imagine where Sonoma and northern Marin County would be today if we didn't have that dam? We'd be dry. So earmarks aren't always a bad thing, but they were frequently used to kind of promote a, um, a, a comedy between the parties to where um, even though the power was in the hands of one party, the other party could benefit as these bills came around and the other party would typically vote for those bills. Not just the appropriations bills, but uh, there, for many years there was great cooperation between Republicans and Democrats and really important legislation passed. The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Endangered Species Act uh, that President Nixon um, proposed the Clean Water Act, the Americans with Disabilities, all of those major pieces of legislation were supported in the Congress by Republicans and Democrats. You can only imagine with today's animosity that probably not a one of those uh, would get past its first committee. All of the cooperation <clears throat> changed when Newt Gingrich was elected speaker. And I'm not saying it's all because of him or blaming him, but for the first time in 60 years, the Republicans weren't wandering around in the desert anymore. They had control of the House. And they liked it. I mean, all of the Democrats got wiped out of power. You know, the moving people were busy full time moving desks and chairs and everything out of those beautiful committee chairman's offices and Republicans were in them for once. And they realized that it was very good to have that kind of power. But Newt Gingrich uh, told them that the power came not from them as individuals, but from having a group. And the important thing that that group had to do was perpetuate itself. And so the and so he instituted very, very strong regimentation, very strong discipline, and 
it was known throughout the Republican Party that the good had to be for the good of the group and not individuals. And a group speak developed whereby everyone was expected to stay in line because that was the way they got the power and that was the way they were going to keep it. On the other side, of course, the Democrats were now out in the desert. Uh, they had lost power completely. They didn't like that. Um, they weren't used to that. And they came to the same conclusion, uh, that the only way we're going to get back is as a group, and the only way we're going to get back is to fight that group on the other side. And that didn't mean individuals. It meant a very regimented, organized way of fighting. And so the Congress really did develop into uh, adversarial, group-oriented uh, combat. And it is that way to today. today. Um, members are assigned fundraising tasks. Every, every member in the majority and minority party will be assigned a quota to raise funds. And not to raise funds for their own campaign committee, like we used to do, but to raise funds for the group. Um, I attended a fundraising event recently in Napa, and a very well attended, a lot of money raised, and the member of Congress that it was raised for took me aside and said, I won't get any of this. Tomorrow, the Democratic uh, Congressional Committee will ask me how much we raised and where's the check. Um, and the same thing, of course, happens on the Republican side. And so the, um, the goal then became uh, perpetuation of power. And legislation and the other types of things that Congress did and does uh, became secondary to that. Um, and it also um, spilled over very heavily to legislation. Uh, Congressman Thompson, Mike Thompson, told me recently that he was chastised because he had a piece of legislation uh, having to do with solar energy, and it was, it was a good piece of legislation and popular, and he had made the mistake of having a Republican co-author uh, for that legislation, and um, the leadership of the Democratic Party said, we're targeting that Republican that's a co-author of your bill, so get him off that bill. Uh, that is the kind of mentality that you have now that, that Gene and Gordon can tell you we never had in the past and would have been embarrassed to have. Um, what happens now, too, is that, of course, um, the House gets, especially the House and also the Senate, but they get into kind of symbolic legislation that isn't going anywhere, that everyone knows isn't going anywhere, but they do it anyway. I mean, I think they've defeated Obamacare three or four times in the House, and they take up symbolic legislation, and that is meant to just kind of coalesce uh, their groups out there in the country, to keep people active, to keep that Republican majority, and the Democrats would do exactly the same thing where they in control. Um, all of the major legislation is stalled. Uh, they don't do any of the appropriation bills anymore, um, not a, like we used to for each of the departments of government. They do one big bill, they call it a continuing resolution, where they take a bill that happened a long time ago and just keep passing it along at a, at a minimal speed. Um, a good example of this is, uh, here we are, the 25th of March. By the end of this month, all of the highway programs in the country are going to shut down. Uh, because the highway bill hasn't passed. And the Department of Transportation won't be funded. And a lot of these projects, we have quite a few of them along 101. I wish we had more along Highway 12 here. Um, those projects will be shut down if Congress doesn't do anything. Uh, well, they will probably do something. They'll probably do what they always do. They'll wait till midnight and then pass it for another three months. And then three months from now, everybody will be in the same boat. It's really no way to, to run 
um, a railroad or a country. Um, now, how do we used to do the highway bill? Um, we used to do the highway bill with both parties. Uh, we would, um, Speaker O'Neill, Tip O'Neill, uh, once made the remark that all politics is local. And that's true. Even though you may be a big shot in Washington, you have to come back and get elected in your own district. Well, there's nothing more local than a highway. And the highway bill was always crafted so that most of the members would have a stake in that bill. You know, we've got lots of improvements on Highway 101. I mean, all the way to Eureka. The Willits Bypass, the Cloverdale Bypass, the, uh, the bottlenecks up and down. All those, uh, you know, have earmarks to them. And that's how the highway bill was put together. In 1987, um, we had a, a big highway bill. What happens is you, you all pay gas tax, we all do, and when th that builds up uh, to a certain amount, they do a highway bill and spend it. And the, the money and the gas tax have to be spent on the highways. And so what we would do is go around to the members and you know what projects are needed in your district, and we would build the highway bill that way. Well, in 1987, um, President Reagan uh, saw what we were doing in the highway bill and he said, uh, what did he say? He said it had too many special projects in it. And he said he saw more lard in that bill than he had seen at the Iowa State Fair when he was giving out blue ribbons. Um, and he threatened to veto the bill. So we had to actually get more projects in the bill so we could uh, override the veto by two-thirds votes. Um, and we passed the bill, he vetoed it, and uh, he actually came to Capitol Hill to beg the members to, to uphold his veto. And over on the Republican side, there were 13 Republicans that he targeted, and, and Reagan had since said that he literally begged them, please uphold my veto of that bill. But so strong is the impetus to vote for a bill when you have your project in it that not a one of those 13 people of his own party um, would do that and that highway bill passed. Well, I'm not saying that earmarks are the, you know, the uh, be all, end all of how we need to change the Congress. But it is, it was, was. now earmarks are, are not legal anymore. The Republicans did away with them, and that's why the highway bill isn't going anywhere. And we'll see what happens between now and the end of this month with it. Um, but the reason I point this out is something has to change to share power in the Congress. Um, it can't go on the way it is with, with solidified warring parties. It can go on with people of philosophical differences, individuals in the party squaring off on legislation. But this solidified uh, balkanization of party power uh, really will serve the country very poorly. Um, when we were in the legislature and Willie Brown became speaker, albeit that he had Republican support to be speaker, he shared the chairmanships between the Republican and Democrats, and it worked very well. And uh, there's no reason why in the Congress more of that power can't be shared. Maybe all the chairmanships go to one party, but the subcommittee chairmanships can be shared. But whether you do it that way, or through earmarks, or through allowing others to participate in the important legislation, uh, something has to happen to give each side a piece of the action. Um, because the way the Congress operates now, under the winner-take-all, um, it, it just simply doesn't work. Um, and I think, who knows how this will come about, I think probably it will come about from that 13%, because at some point, um, the leadership in the Congress on both sides is going to realize that you can't survive either of them with 13% of the public support. And when that realization comes about, um, hopefully we'll see a Congress that uh, settles in 
uh, to the way it used to be where um, the business of the country came first and the vulcanization of the parties uh, was far down on the list. Um, with that, I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Barnard. Uh, you can't tell the difference when I'm standing. Sitting. <laughs> you have a nice tie. <laughs> you do as well. Okay. Uh, do you think we'll ever have national health care as they have in Europe? That's one of my questions. And do you think Congress is going to eliminate Saturday delivery of mail? That's uh, and do you think Dick Cheney would have had his heart transplant at age 71 when it's supposed to be not over 55 if he hadn't been uh, a vice president? <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, of course, a lot will um, depend on how the Supreme Court decides what's called Obamacare, um, which they're going to be hearing this next week. Um, the, um, and, and all of that depends on how they interpret the Commerce Clause. And, and interestingly, the aspect of it that is going to be the, either the yes or no on the bill is the part that requires people to, have, to buy insurance. And it was the Republicans that insisted on that, that people be, um, have to buy private insurance. And that was supported um, by the private insurance industry. Um, so it will depend on what happens with Obamacare. Certainly national health insurance won't happen if Obamacare is upheld, because that will go on for a while, you know, and we'll see how it works. Um, if Obamacare fails, we'll be back to where, again, there's a large uh, percentage of people that have no insurance, and, uh, and there will be a lot of pressure for a national um, single-payer plan. Um, and I don't know if that will happen. You know, it, it might happen sometime, but it's not going to happen in the near future. Certainly it wouldn't happen in today's Congress. Now, with uh, Vice President Cheney, of course, that is the fear that has been raised, is does some sort of national system in and of itself require um, um, rationing of health care? And the bill itself prohibits it, but I think it only makes sense that as expenses rise, there will be a chipping away at that. I'm not sure it will be the people that are 80 can't have heart transplants, but it could be. Um, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, costs for health care are escalating exponentially, and at some point there will be a, an impetus to do something about the costs, and rationing probably will be a part of that factor. I hope it isn't, but you, know, you can sort of see it coming down the track, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Pardon? Saturday mail delivery. Saturday mail delivery. Eliminating. <laughs> yeah, well, that's part of the rationing process. It probably will be eliminated. Yeah. yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, okay. Hi, Deb. Um, you didn't mention anything about campaign finance reform, and I, I have a strong feeling that money is part of the, <laughs> a deep rooted issue here. That, the elephant in the room when it comes to um, why the politics isn't working in Washington. Can you address that? Oh, definitely. Um, money has taken a predominant role far greater than it ever has in the past. And interestingly, um, the, the same groups support both parties. It used to be that you could sort of count that the Wall Street folks would support the Republicans and the unions that support the Democrats, and you know, you can sort of figure out what group supported each. Now they all, it's all intermixed. And Wall Street's given President Obama as much or more money than it has 
his opponents. And you have these um, odd groups all over that are independent groups that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars. And none of this can be very good because the influence of money in politics is, is generally not for the broad public good, but it's for specific interests. And then the Supreme Court uh, did an incredible decision, the Citizens United decision, um, whereby it determined that corporations were actually people and had the right of free speech. Um, corporations have never enjoyed the role of being individuals. In fact, that is the whole purpose of having a corporation. The, the, the reason for a corporate structure is that individuals aren't individually liable for that business, and the corporation is. Uh, so the whole reason for having corporations was to not be an individual, and then the Supreme Court rules um, that for the purpose of giving campaign funds, corporations are individuals and have the right to do as much as they want because that is their right to free speech. Um, that will very dramatically change the political landscape. Um, and in the Congress, too. As I mentioned in my talk, uh, the individual members of Congress are raising money like crazy now. And, you know, um, when all those interests pour into Washington, it, um, it uh, doesn't bode well for the average person and the type of thing most Americans want to see done. I mean, here all over the country you have foreclosures and the uh, aftermath of the terrible banking um, uh, collapse, and those people are back in the saddle again, you know, and the average people got screwed by that whole thing, or just as much impotent as they ever were. And all of that, I think, is because of way too much money in the system. We didn't have that much money in the system. I think when I ran for Congress, it was, you know, it mostly spent uh, 150000 or something. Now, the race over here in the second district that I was telling you about, um, each candidate expects to spend a million dollars in the primary. Where do you get that kind of money? You don't get it from um, lemonade stands. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, two parts. One, uh, could you comment on the um, fiscal situation in the country as a whole? I mean, every year the deficits get larger. The, the debt that the country is accumulating is huge. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on that and how we can dig ourselves out of that. Uh, I know that uh, Representative Ryan has uh, proposed a budget that, of course, will never pass, but uh, we haven't had a budget in three years from April. Um, there has to be some way to cap all the spending. And secondly, 13% approve of the way Congress is operating, and yet 87% keep reelecting the same people they don't approve of. Can you comment on that? Well, the, I, I personally feel that the government spends way too much money. I mean, we're involved in foreign wars, we're involved in this um, huge increase in health costs, the, the Medicare and Medicaid here in the state, and um, all kinds of ways that our children are going to have to pay this Bill and always spending has been a factor of domestic <coughs> product. And you know, if, if you can earn your way and produce your way to the level of spending, then even though you might be in debt, you're still above water. Uh, now it's you know the, the the ratios are way off, and the debt is way above the country's um, reasonable ability to repay it. And that's going to have a very big effect in the future. You know, Congress does an interesting exercise on this that, that you probably have noticed when they get into these uh, very heated practices about the debt ceiling. 
Um, and and the, these always take exactly the same tone. Uh, the secretary of the treasury will come, will come to Congress and say, we're just about ready to, to hit the debt ceiling and we got to increase it, right? And then the Republicans will get all up in arms. We're not going to increase it. And the Democrats say, yes, we have to increase it. And the president will get involved in it. Well, let's look at this. Um, what is the debt ceiling? Um, there is no debt ceiling. I mean, the Constitution doesn't say that there's a debt ceiling. Um, Congress sets a debt ceiling. And what it is, is the debt ceiling is not new spending. The debt ceiling is what they've already spent. And it's just, do we pay our bills? That's all it is. It's, we have spent this much money and the Secretary of Treasury needs to raise that debt ceiling so we can pay those bills. Uh, but it always is made to seem like it's, it's a, um, an exercise on whether we can spend more or not. Uh, it isn't. Uh, this debt ceiling is just simply paying the bills that already have come in. And of course the country has to pay its bills if it didn't, uh, it would create a calamity in the financial markets. Um, but, uh, so that debate almost never leads to any cost cutting. You know, it usually leads to some innocuous committee being formed or some piece of legislation that doesn't have any teeth that's expected to cut spending like it did the last time. Remember that committee got set up and a lot of ballyhoo about it and you've never heard a word from them since. Um, but some effort has to definitely be made to curb spending. And it, it used to happen when we would do those appropriation bills. Um, because each department then was scrutinized by the Congress and the bills were looked at. To how much are you spending? How much did you spend last year? The Congress did this every year. Now they don't do it at all. Now there's one great big bill that kind of works its way through the system, and all of the departments are lumped into it. And you know, you don't make individual decisions over the different wars that are being fought or the different military equipment being sought by the Department of Defense as opposed to the Health and Human Services or the uh, Interior Department. Those judgments aren't made individually anymore by Congress. And it's too bad because the way it used to be done was much better. Thank you for your excellent talk today. We reinforced what the 13% of us already knew. But I'm going to suggest maybe a compromise that, that would work. Uh, the Republicans, for example, have signed a pledge that they will never raise taxes. And on the Democratic side, they vow they will never lower Social Security or Medicare. What about a candidate who stands up and says, I'll tell you what, we'll incrementally lower benefits for Medicare and we'll incrementally not 10% or 20%, through 2 or 3% of your taxes and gradually uh, reduce the deficit and reduce spending. And he doesn't have to be a Republican or a Democrat. I think that's the candidate I'm looking for, is someone who will walk into Congress and say, I'm going to do both. I'm going to cut spending, and I'm going to also uh, cut uh, the uh, entitlement programs. Would that work for our candidates? Well, I wish the filing deadline hadn't passed about a week ago. <laughs> I, I think we could find out. I mean, that sounds like a very rational approach, and, and probably the public is ready for that kind of an approach. Uh, but, you know, it's these interest groups that always get in the way, um, that, uh, that focused interest groups seem to have, especially if they're well-financed like they are now, seem to have a much better inroads than the public as a whole uh, to those kind of reasonable solutions. And certainly with this balkanization that there is now, something like that wouldn't happen. I have a two-part question. Uh, the first question is, why are congressmen and senators immune from prosecution for insider trading where as it's a criminal offense for anybody else. And the second question is to follow up on what this gentleman just said, the no tax increase pledge 
pledges are made to Grover Norquist. Would you care to comment about his influence on the Congress of the United States? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, first, about the um, insider trading for members of Congress. And I think it hadn't ever occurred to anyone that the votes that you take on committees, especially if you have control over the outcome, uh, can easily have a uh, very direct impact on the markets and on individual stocks. And, um, <coughs> It never had come into anyone's thinking that legislators or members of Congress uh, somehow would um, would be involved in insider trading. Uh, but it's certain. But uh, I believe, and I don't know if it already has passed or it will. But there is legislation now to prohibit insider trading, and I'm, I'm really sure that it'll pass um, because. Um, it, a terrible practice. Um, the um, I'm sorry, the second part of your question. Oh, Grover Norquist. Um, when when you run for Congress, any candidate for Congress will get questionnaires from every conceivable group that there is: the ACLU, the Sierra Club the Bankers Association, the insurance industry, and you're expected to fill out those questionnaires. And these groups tend to expect 100% um, fidelity once you've, once you've agreed to something on these forms. And that follows through, uh, if you're a member of Congress, you get rated by every conceivable group, the Chamber of Commerce, the Sierra Club, one of the candidates over the other night said, I have a 100% rating from the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters, the Planned Parenthood, the, you know, he lists 15 things that he had a 100% rating with. And I thought to myself, well, you shouldn't have a 100% rating with everybody, you know? Uh, aren't there nuances to some of these things? I, you know, every once in a while, shouldn't you maybe vote on the other side? And, um, all of this has kind of morphed into now the Grover Norquist where you take a pledge that you won't ever raise taxes. I mean, people are elected to public office to judge each legislation on its own. Is there a need for it? Is, is it justified? Will it help the country? Um, you, no one can presuppose those things. I mean, we're not, you don't have a crystal ball in front of you where you know Five years from now, you'll never raise taxes. You know? um, President Reagan wasn't that way. President Bush wasn't that way. Um, the Democratic presidents weren't that way. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's almost, um, um, I don't want to say it should be illegal, but it, it really is a, a questionable practice to, to take oaths to these different groups, you know, that you will or won't do something. Because what does that do? It deprives the public as a whole of your independent judgment on what's happening at any given time. And really, you, when, you take an, when you take office, you take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, which is a very complex um, document that is meant to govern all of the people. You don't take an oath, you know, to uphold the Chamber of Commerce or the Sierra Club or something. <laughs> Mr. Busco, first off, I wonder, I feel like I'm listening to Mr. Smith goes to Washington and Jimmy Stewart here. You decide to run again, I'm on your campaign. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you why I'm not going to. I, I <laughs> uh, as great a tragedy as 9-11 was, 3,000 souls were lost that time. 100,000 people have been killed by gun violence. Gabby Gifford didn't do it. There are only 3 million members of an NRA in a 300 million country. What do we, the people, have to do to stop this damn gun violence in this country? Yay. Do you guys have any non-controversial yeah. things? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you're speaking to the choir, too. I, um, I have gone through periods of my life where I hunt. And I like the outdoors, and I'm not against hunting. I 
I am not against having a rifle. I'm not against uh, self-protection, but it's really gotten way beyond that. You know, where we just have way too many guns in the hands of way too many disparate people, and it's starting to show up everywhere. I mean, look at what happened in Florida. Terrible. Um, and President Obama, I think, was very poignant on that subject. Um, but there again, you know, you have extremely strong lobbying the gun interest, just very heavily financed. And a lot of the NRA money comes from the gun producers. You, know, the, when you talk about the Citizens United, that all is part of that. You know, those corporations now can get as much money as, as they want. Um, um, I don't know, you know, the uh, Brady Bill and those type of things were uh, good approaches, I thought. I don't know what's going to happen. We're helpless. Good being. Uh, thank you very much for your, your talk. Uh, at this point in our history, do you see any prospect for an active third party? An active, active third, third party? party. Well, of course, you're asking someone that's rather jaundiced about that, <laughs> given the story I told you about <laughs> my election in 1990. Um, an active third party. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think if the current parties go in the direction they have been going, there could be a real strong opening for, for that. It would probably have to start with a strong candidate, a strong, well-financed candidate, rather than a party kind of just developing from a grassroots. Um, I think a, a, a politician that was reasonable, balanced, somehow had a lot of money behind him which, or her, which sometimes those all don't go together. <laughs> um, could do it. Um, the structure is pretty much against that, though. Um, you know, the money funnels into the parties, and that generally will dictate who succeeds. Um, I guess if I had to say, I would say the chances of the third party are very little. In California now, you know, we have a, starting this June, we have a whole new system of nominating people. And that may result in more moderate people on both sides being nominated. Because it used to be in the primary where the Republicans would nominate a candidate, the Democrats would nominate a candidate, and they'd run against each other in November. Now everyone's going to be on the ballot. And it's called citizens' nomination. And so people will vote for whomever they want on that ballot, and the top two Will, will run in November. And the top two may not be a Republican and a Democrat. It uh, may be any, maybe two Democrats, two Republicans, or independent and a Republican, or any combination thereof. So that's expected or hoped that that will allow more moderate people to get elected. Because as it works now, generally the most liberal Democrat gets nominated and the most conservative Republican gets nominated, and at least in our area, the most liberal Democrat wins. Um, now it could be that a, a conservative Democrat and a liberal Democrat running against each other, and then the Republicans have a choice between those two. Um, and so therefore the Republicans would have a little more power in the election. One of my pet peeves of Congress has been the seniority uh, system. My experience at the university is because you have seniority, it doesn't mean you're the most energetic, creative, or enlightened. <laughs> Would you respond to the effects of the seniority system? Well, the seniority system lasted for a long <coughs> period of time, and it had some benefits. The benefits that it had is the committee chairmanships and subcommittee chairmanships were automatic. And therefore, there wasn't a whole lot of acrimony in the group as to who got those plum positions. And there wasn't a lot of um, fight, infighting. Uh, th those positions are always in the majority party, as, as I pointed out. 
pointed out. Um, the bad part is, as you say, you, it's not a meritocracy. Uh, you, you rise to the top uh, basically by longevity. And um, it's very hard to overturn a committee chairman under the seniority system. I remember when um, Carl Vinson uh, was chairman of the House um, um, Appropriate, appropriations for military um, expenditures. Um, he barely, some, he would sit on the House floor and there were people that wondered if he still had a pulse. <laughs> and um, so one of the members did decide to run against him, you know. And by a very, that, that had to be voted on by the whole House to overturn a committee chairman that had been chosen by the seniority system. And by a very narrow margin, um, they did. Uh, they named a battleship after Carl Benson, but <laughs> he lost his chairmanship. Um, it probably isn't the best way. Um, they've never developed a better way, though, in a way. When the Republicans took over, they elected their committee chairman. Uh, but they elected them according to what Newt Gingrich wanted them to do. So, um, so I don't know if it really resulted in more capable people being appointed. The institution is extremely political, as you might guess. And uh, whenever you are choosing someone to do anything in that sort of a milieu, um, the the chance of getting someone that is the most qualified uh, oftentimes gets kind of clouded over with a whole lot of other considerations. I didn't answer your question, but uh, <laughs> it, it always is pretty much the elders. And I, and I told you that it is an oligarchy. There is no two ways about it. Um, it's not, the Congress is not run as a democracy. It is an oligarchy that is controlled about 20% of the members of Congress control the whole place. And about 50%, you know, are there and enjoying their stay and kind of going about their business, weighing in on votes. And maybe the middle 30% is sort of a little bit more than that, but not quite in the power structure. Uh, but 20% run the place. And just to comment real quickly on in defense of the seniority system, a fellow named Carlos Moorhead was in the Congress. And when Gingrich came to power, he had the most seniority. He was probably the best bipartisan representative. He was Republican, but he represented well four major cities in Southern California. And he was shunted aside because he, he should have had his choice of committee positions. He was shown aside by English because he worked with Democrats. He would not tolerate that. So that's in defense of the seniority system. But I have a question about the budget that was presented by Paul White. And it's a question because I've, I've read, I read certain documents, uh, try to understand how that ferrets out for the country. Does it solve the, quote, debt problem? And if it does, on whose back is it solving that? And um, Ryan has proposed certain cuts in the domestic programs and has also proposed tax changes and, and continuation of the Bush tax cuts. So I, I try to read these things. And is there a, I know the CBO supposedly gives a non-biased, uh, non-partisan approach to evaluating the budget. But is there a nonpartisan review of these budgets to say, hey, this is being born on the backs of the poor, or we're still going to have a major deficit of all, if all those tax cuts go through and the program cuts? So I'm just uh, asking you for a source that we could uh, look at to understand the validity of both uh, sides of the arguments. Well, the Congressional Budget Office was set up to be an independent voice on that very subject, to analyze the budget, determine who benefited from it, who didn't, and what effect it would have on the overall deficit. 
And um, it does that, but every year when that report comes out, it is roundly criticized by uh, both parties um, who all point to their own independent sources for that kind of information. But I have always found that the Congressional Budget Office is, is the most accurate depiction of the very type of things you're talking about. Um, as I say, every once in a while they get into this squabble over the debt ceiling, but the, the debt ceiling is set by Congress. It really has almost nothing to do with what they actually spend. It's just every once in a while they come up against the debt ceiling that they set, and they've already spent that money, and they fight over whether they should pay the bill. But that is not the same as coming down to the hardcore decisions that are needed to cut the budget. And everybody agrees that the spending is too great right now. But of course, not everybody agrees where it should be cut. Uh, most of us who are, you know, of that age don't like to see Medicare cut, for instance. Um, maybe we'd rather see the war in Afghanistan um, settled. Um, but, you know, those kind of things, somebody's got to do what this gentleman said and, and sort of cut across the board and make everybody um, experience some of the pain. Well, I, I want to thank the congressman for an absolutely wonderful speech. Uh, one of those things that